Hello everyone. Today I'll be finishing up the pharmacology portion of this series by discussing prothrombotic medications. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the mechanism of action, pharmacology, side effects, and indications of desmopressin, also known as DDAVP, recombinant factor 7A, more commonly known as Novo7, the very new medication, emicizumab, and the antifibrinolytic agents aminocaproic acid and tranexamic acid. But before getting into each individual medication, I'm going to start with a bigger question. Why are prothrombotic medications so uncommonly used? You may not have thought about it before, but compare how often you've seen or heard about clopidogrel, heparin, warfarin, or the DOAX used, or just aspirin, one of, if not the most prescribed medication in the world. These antithrombotic meds are everywhere. But if you're not a surgeon or an ER physician, it's possible you've never even seen a prothrombotic medication used. Yet it seems like patients who have problems with bleeding are very roughly as common as patients who have problems with unwanted thrombosis. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a single definitive answer. Maybe it's partly because these medications are just not that effective. Maybe it's because some of them, for example, Novo7 and other isolated clotting factors, are extremely expensive, making them not cost-effective. And maybe it's because of the adage that you can always transfuse blood, but you can't transfuse brain, meaning that when you are trying to balance the body's antithrombotic and prothrombotic systems, it's preferable to err on the side favoring the antithrombotic one because you can always give a bleeding patient transfusions but if the patient has a massive ischemic stroke, we don't have any good treatment for that. So I, in the end, I don't really know, but I think it's an interesting question. But moving on to the specific medications, first up is desmopressin. Desmopressin is an analog of antidiuretic hormone, but one which lacks ADH's vasopressor activity. It's thought to act on coagulation by inducing the release of von Willebrand factor, as well as factor VIII from the endothelium, the former of which serves as a bridge between adjacent activated platelets. Desmopressin can be given via IV, sub-Q, or intranasal routes. Improvement in lab tests of coagulation can be seen after just one hour. However, tachyphylaxis, that is a reduced responsiveness with repeated doses, is common, sometimes seen as early as the third dose. Regarding side effects, you might expect that thrombosis would be one, and while that has been reported, hyponatremia is actually a larger concern related to desmopressin's action in the distal tubule of the kidney, affecting sodium and water homeostasis. Common indications for desmopressin include acute bleeding or prophylaxis of surgical bleeding in patients with uremia, hemophilia A, and von Willebrand disease type 1. I'll be talking about these diseases in later videos. The next drug is recombinant activated factor 7. I'm not usually a fan of using brand names for drugs, but Novo7 is so much easier, I'm going to make an exception this one time. Regarding its mechanism, it seems obvious that Novo7 should work just like endogenous activated 7 by increasing the activity of the tissue factor pathway via its interaction with tissue factor. After all, Novo7 is structurally the same molecule as endogenous 7. However, when given in supraphysiological doses, it appears to increase factor X activation and thrombin generation in a tissue factor independent, platelet dependent manner. Therefore, the effectiveness of Novo7 is dependent upon the level of endogenous factor X, level of prothrombin, platelet count, and platelet function. What are its FDA approved indications? Hemophilia A and B, acquired hemophilia, congenital factor VII deficiency, and a rare platelet disorder called Glanzmann's thrombosthenia. And what are its common off-label uses? Almost any situation in which a patient is experiencing refractory, life-threatening hemorrhage. In other words, for a patient who is bleeding to death, it's sometimes used as part of a kitchen sink approach in which everything possible is desperately thrown at the patient when conventional therapies have failed. 
I personally did this once for a patient with spontaneous hemopericardium related to warfarin overdose. And I will say, in that one circumstance, it happened to have worked. Unfortunately, there is a huge difficulty in formally studying the effectiveness of such use of Novo7 because it's impossible to adequately consent such a patient for enrollment in a clinical trial and because the underlying diagnoses are so varied. We probably should not be lumping in Novo7's effectiveness in patients with massive hemoptysis, secondary to a bleeding lung cancer, together with a patient bleeding out from a gunshot wound. But the data that we do have, as imperfect as it is, suggests that, in general, Novo7 appears to decrease transfusion requirements while leading to a possible increase in thromboembolic events, with no significant difference in overall mortality. What the data doesn't yet tell us, however, is whether or not there are specific indications outside those already approved by the FDA in which Novo7 might be of greater benefit. For example, maybe it actually is helpful for massive hemoptysis, but that signal gets lost in the noise of every other indication that's included in the meta-analyses. Another consideration is its cost. Depending on the dose used, a single dose in the United States can cost between five and $15,000 or more. The bottom line on Novo7 is that expert consensus is its use should probably be confined to the approved indications and to clinical trials. However, its use as part of a last-ditch effort to stop potentially fatal hemorrhage in much broader situations will likely continue. And it's hard to fault clinicians for using it this way when a patient is literally bleeding to death in front of them and the drug seems like it should help. The third prothrombotic medication I'll mention is emicizumab. This is a recombinant bispecific monoclonal antibody that simultaneously binds factors 9A and 10, substituting for activated factor 8, which frankly is just plain cool. It was approved by the FDA in 2017 for the prophylaxis against bleeding in patients with hemophilia A, which as I'll discuss in a later video, is an inherited deficiency of factor 8. The med is administered subcutaneously once every one to four weeks. Due to its long onset of action, it is not effective for acute bleeding. The last I'll discuss today are the antifibrinolytic medications. These include aminocaproic acid, marketed in the U.S. as Amacar, and tranexamic acid, marketed as Lestida, and frequently referred to in medical notes as TXA. These medications act by inhibiting the activation and or action of plasmin. They can be administered orally, via IV, or in the case of tranexamic acid, as a nebulized mist. There are a lot of indications for these, including heavy menstrual bleeding, intracranial bleeding related to the use of TPA, control of bleeding related to severe thrombocytopenia, perioperative blood loss in orthopedic and cardiovascular surgery, which is where I've most commonly seen it used, tooth extractions in patients with hemophilia, traumatic hyphema, which is blood in the anterior chamber of the eye, and stable massive hemoptysis, where it's given via nebulizer. So those are the major prothrombotic drugs. With the exception of Novo7, drugs which I did not discuss include all of the other individual clotting factors. That's because these other factors are used only for specific factor deficiencies, which aside from hemophilia A and B, are extremely rare with incidences in the neighborhood of 1 in 1 million. The next three videos in this series will discuss platelet disorders, starting with thrombocytopenia. <laughs>